Good evening, welcome. I'm John, I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore. We're so pleased to welcome Philip Denieri to our At Home with Literati series and support the Appalachian Trail. Uh, he'll be joined in conversation this evening by our friend, Jeremy Chamberlain. Just a quick webinar overview for our attendees. The chat is closed, uh, but you may wanna keep the chat window open during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase the Appalachian Trail from Literati throughout the event. Um, you can use the Q&A feature, as I mentioned, it's available to you on the bottom of your screen to ask questions at any time, and I will read a selection at the conclusion of the conversation. Um, and as a reminder, uh, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to you anywhere in the United States. But of course, if you live in Ann Arbor or Southeast Michigan, our doors are open to the public. And in lieu of a book purchase, we'd also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming uh, while it lasts. Hopefully we'll soon be returning to in-person events. Um, so whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription to our virtual programming, you can make donations at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this afternoon or this morning or this evening, depending uh, later this evening, depending on where and when in the world uh, you may be joining us. And now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Philip Denieri teaches courses on the built environment at the University of Michigan. He worked in public radio journalism and state government before earning a PhD in urban and regional planning at Michigan. He lives in Ann Arbor. And Jeremiah Chamberlain teaches literature and creative writing courses for the Department of English at the University of Michigan. He's editor in chief of Fiction Writers Review and a contributing editor for Poets and Writers Magazine. His work has appeared in such places as Flyway, Glimmer Train, Granta, and the Michigan Quarterly Review. In 2017, he was a Fulbright Research Scholar in Bulgaria. Please join me in welcoming Philip Denieri and Jeremiah Chamberlain into your living rooms. Thanks, John. It's great to be here. And hi, Phil. Nice Hello, to see Jeremy. You, you too. Across town through the interwebs. Uh, congratulations on this marvelous book. I was so excited to. Uh, to read it. You can see all my notes here on it <laughs> as I've been reading, diving through it. Um, and it's a particularly uh, wonderful experience to see it on the desk here because I had the great pleasure of reading excerpts and chapters of it three years ago when we were both fellows at the Institute for the Humanities here at the University of Michigan, uh, a marvelous program, uh, one that uh, brought together a whole wonderful cohort of, of people. Um, so it's marvelous just to see the book between covers. So um, congrats, congrats. Well, thanks. It, uh, it is, it's marvelous, it's fun, it's, uh, it's weird, it's odd. Um, as a first time author, um, uh, the, the transition from the book being a project and something in progress to it being a product to be you know, marketed and talked about is a very weird transition, uh, but obviously very fun and exciting. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's do this then. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, we'll end up at the end, at the <laughs> end. But um, I was trying to think back to our earlier conversations and I was trying to remember what exactly was it that drew you to this story? You said near the end of the book um, that it was as much the identity of the Appalachian Trail as the Appalachian Trail that drew you to some of the research. But I wonder if you could say more about the seed or genesis that moved you from curiosity, which is one state of being, to investigation, which is another. Yeah, it was a couple things. Um, so there's sort of two points of entry for me. I mean, number one, growing up in the Eastern US, you just know that the AT is out there. Um, you, you, you drive down the Massachusetts Turnpike and there's this pedestrian bridge over the interstate that says Appalachian Trail on it. And uh, so it's just kind of, of out there and you know that it's this, this ribbon of nature that's uh, winding its way through the very developed and built up Eastern part of the country. Um, I had a, a good friend in high school who said, you know, someday we should hike the AT of Maine together, um, which we never did. Um, so, uh, always a place that interested me. Um, 
Uh, and, uh, you know, I have thought about maybe hiking the whole thing one day. It's now clear that I'm never going to do that. Uh, I mentioned that to somebody who works for the publisher and she said, well, that sounds like just about every guy I've ever dated, uh, you know, has thought, hey, maybe I'll through hike the 18 one day. Um, but uh, much more recently, when I became a grad student in urban and regional planning, I read this seminal thinker in the field of urban planning named Benton Mackay, who in the 1920s and 30s had put out all these interesting ideas about the shape of metropolitan America and how it could fit into the natural systems around it. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that this same person who was doing all this urban thinking was the one who had invented the AT. And that just seemed like something worth digging into uh, a bit more. Um, so those were the sort of two, two starting points. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that leads me to kind of build off that a little bit more, both in terms of the, the built environment, which is something that you, you teach here at the University of Michigan, um, but also the idea of nature as a construct. Um, this seems to be, and you gesture towards it a minute ago with your comment, this seems to be one of the things you're most dialed into. Um, you call the book a biography rather than a history right there on the cover. Um, but in fact, there is a, another storyline that seems to be about that. Is that fair to say that? How do we think about nature? What is it? What's our relationship to it? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, the, the, the Appalachian Trail, like so many environments, is a combination of the built and the natural. And that the, the interplay between those two and the tensions between them and the parts of the built and the natural that we acknowledge and embrace in places like the AT and the parts that we just pretend aren't there, that is endlessly fascinating to me. Um, so I teach a course around that. And you know, my poor students have heard a lot more about the Appalachian Trail than they probably ever cared to. Um, but the AT to me was a perfect place to tease out this, to me, very human process of, of crafting a version of nature around ourselves and actually building our hopes and our needs and our aspirations and our escapism into the environment and crafting the environment around that. Um, you know, we, we, we want to talk about nature as that which is separate from us. And that's why it's something cool to escape to. Mm -hmm. But to make it an escapable place, we've actually got to make it work for us in a bunch of different ways. We've got to construct it. And that process um, is what I was trying to get at in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we begin this biography uh, in the late 19th century, 1860s. Uh, and we move mostly through up to the present. Um, the final chapter is focusing a little bit more in the 60s and 70s and what we would maybe describe as the rise of the um, environmental movement uh, with people like Gaylord Nelson and even, even JFK um, writing about the way in which our um, understanding of the natural world was almost like an antidote to contemporary life. Uh, and in even more recent years, uh, we have many books writing about the nature deficit disorder. Uh, so in the span of a little bit more than a century, I guess more like a century and a half, we move from the terrors of the wilderness. Don't go near it. <laughs> it'll kill you. There's not a lot out, out there to without it, we'll, it'll kill us. Um, that's a pretty big sizing yeah. shift. With a lot of interesting stops along yeah. the way. Um, so the, the reason the book is organized as, uh, you know, profiles of individuals at different points in time is to, in some sense, try to capture what were people at that period of time seeking from nature and therefore building into the trail. But, um, you know, just to pick up on those two bookends a little bit, before nature was a, a, a retreat and a place to escape to, it not only was dangerous, um, it was perceived as morally compromised. The, the place where we were civilized and safe and okay. And when I say we, I mean European culture and European Americans, um, uh, you know, was in towns and, uh, you know, church. And, you know, so it, it wasn't just physically dangerous, but it was morally dangerous to go outside of those bounds. Uh, it's only as we get safer and more comfortable in the industrial advanced economy of the late 1800s 
that uh, you know, people seek the outdoors for adventure. Um, we seek a lot of other things out of it over you know, the time periods that the book deals with. The one that you didn't mention is at the very end in Bill Bryson's book about hiking on the Appalachian Trail, it's, it's a, a nature of irony. It's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he's, he's poking fun at himself and, and nature uh, um, in a way that you couldn't have gotten away with, wouldn't, wouldn't have seemed at all appropriate, even 20 or 30 years earlier, where it was a very, you know, serious uh, topic. So lots of different versions of nature uh, uh, have emerged over the years. And I was, without, you know, writing a textbook or a dry academic book, I was trying to, you know, sort of, as to use your expression, gesture towards these different things over the mm -hmm. course of the book. Mm -hmm. If we think about them as those stages that we're sort of moving, moving through, Phil, what was the stage that you found most interesting or perplexing or found yourself drawn to as we shift from that? Don't go into nature because it's morally suspect to you know, here, here's somebody who's writing a whole book about hiking the Appalachian Trail. And then, of course, big asterisk doesn't hike a lot of it. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, by the way, far more than I have. But sure. um, no, it's uh, that's a good question. And I'm almost uh ashamed to admit that the part that I enjoyed the most learning and writing about was the chapter about the National Park Service in the 1980s and 90s hmm. bureaucratizing the trail. And I guess this calls on my background in state government and, and even the PhD research I did was on institutions. Um, but I found it really interesting that the trail is a uh, it's a, in many respects, it's many respects, it's a very narrow national park. And it took bureaucracy and procedure and law and eminent domain and planning processes to create this thing and protect it. And um, you certainly don't think, and I don't think anybody except for a very few oddballs like myself want to think about when you're out there on the trail, huh, how was this parcel acquired? And, you know, what was the funding source? Um, but it, there is that aspect to it. And um, so it's this wonderfully naturalistic environment. Um, and as much as I talk about how built it is, and how nestled in the built world it is, you still get that vibe and that feel from it when you're walking on it. Um, but as natural and naturalistic as it is, it also, we only have it because of institutions and bureaucracies mm -hmm. and you know people working in the public sector doing good work in a fairly anonymous way day after day. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, that was the, I think that was the part that I was most attracted to. Mm -hmm. Is that also why the book for you is a biography? Because of course it's a biography of the Appalachian Trail, but it's also these very wonderful biographies of all these individuals. And you know, you go out of your way and I think wisely so to say, this is by no means a full history of who was involved. It's a particular type of history, um, setting aside some of the complicated and complex histories of the US, which is, you know, especially in those days, predominantly white, predominantly male, maybe I can say predominantly middle class, um, you know, you're, you're very careful and I think rightly so to sort of think about some of the different bandwidths. But I do think, you know, one of the things I admired about the book was that the chapters really have these wonderful arcs of each of these individuals' lives, whether it's a, a woman in her 70s after 30 years of marriage who's said to heck with it all and throws a duffel over her shoulder and grabs her umbrella as a cane and, you know, does indeed hike the whole thing and not just once, um, or whether it's, you know, the bureauc bureaucrat at the desk uh, who's trying to um, finagle uh, so that a piece doesn't end up in a uh, eminent domains claims court that the U.S. government has to settle out. I mean, all these little, all these little, these little narratives. Um, did you see them fitting together like a kind of archipelago or did you see them fitting together the way the AT itself does as kind of a little coalition? I'm just curious about how the yeah. larger vision of the book came together for you because it's a massive amount of material if you, you know, think about the, the, the histories and the deep dive of, of research. Yeah, I, I can remember us talking about this in this seminar, um, and uh, and not surprisingly, you had these wonderful different options on offer. Well, are you doing an archipelago, Phil, or is it more of a you know? Um, I don't. 
I'm not sure that I ever fully solved how to tie the pieces together and what the relationship was among them. What I knew I wanted to do was provide these little mini chapter length biographies because it was in these individuals leading their own lives Mm -hmm. and coming upon the trail that the trail got built. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I wanted to show different versions of that over time. And you could really under only understand the human investment in it and the human creation of it. If you could understand these folks as individuals, as, you know, uh, not just representatives of their times, but in all the oddnesses and uniquenesses that any of us have. So I, I was better able to get at the kind of stuff I wanted to get at by telling the story of the trail indirectly through these individuals. Um, but, you know, the, the chapters were written completely separately from one another, for the most part in different years. Uh, uh, then suddenly the deadline was on, <laughs> it was there to turn in the book. And so there might have been a better, I, I think you know, there's, there's a version of this book where it's more, it's stitched together in a better way. Um, well, the other thing about biography versus history is, you know, what I'm trying to do f- for the reader, or at least the story that I wanted to investigate is, what what is this place? Why are we attracted to it? What's the what's its deal? What's its story? And it was more that to me felt more like a biography, like what you would do with an individual. Look at the person's history. Look at the times they lived in, and out of that you get some sense of who they were. And ideally, I think in good biographies you get a sense of more universal human themes as well. You can mm-hmm. you can see yourself in that other person's story. Um, And so that was the kind of stuff I wanted to do as opposed to the, in this year, this happened with the trail and that year that happened with the trail. Yeah, well, you're very modest, Phil, I was gonna say, you're very modest because I think the book actually reads marvelously seamlessly. Um, I think your reader is pulled chapter to chapter really elegantly. I found myself finishing one chapter and just sucked right in into the next one. Um, It does feel, very contiguous. And, and again, I guess a good framework for the book itself is like the trail. You don't know necessarily you're crossing a state line unless <laughs> there's a sign there that says you're now entering, you know, leaving Georgia and, you know, entering uh, uh, the next step. So, so I actually thought that worked well. And in fact, when I hit this um, line from Arnold Goy- Goyot, can you pronounce the last I, name? I right? say it Guillot, but I'm not yeah. a native okay. French speaker. Okay. <laughs> One of the earliest chapters, um, Guillot's says, or you say, um, Gyo thinks nature was not a list, it was a story. And I, I paused on that line and I thought that's that's great when I kind of came back to the beginning of the book after finishing it and was sort of looking through it again for our conversation today, because it felt a bit like it could be almost an epigraph to the book itself. Um, because I, I think that if it were purely a history, it would feel more like a list. And the book doesn't feel at all like a list. The book feels like a good biography, I think also should alive as alive as as, as its subject. So um, I really admired the book and and love moving through. But I wonder if you could talk about that idea of that seems to me also like a shift in thinking. Goyot was one of these fellows who was thinking about the sort of the natural world and the scientific one meeting uh, the cosmological, religious, what, what you can fill in the blank there. But that idea of shifting from nature, not a list to a story. Can you talk about um, his concept and how that as one of the very first shapers of what would later become the AT? I mean, yeah. his work was seminal, it seems. Yeah, he, he was part of um, a, a school of thought or a way of looking in the world that was emerging in Europe in the, in the mid 1800s. Um, uh, Alexander von Humboldt is sort of the most famous proponent of that and um, um, uh, Guillaume was a student of Humboldt's, um, but the the that really is the beginning of what I and others would call the ecological idea. This notion that in the science uh, and the sort of technical understanding of the natural world is an appreciation for 
um, larger things and larger concepts. I don't think, and again, I'm not, um, I mean, I know something about the Appalachian Trail. I'm not an academic environmental historian. There's folks who know a lot more about this than I do. But it's no coincidence that Guillaume was uh, a, a, a fervent Christian and had trained to be a minister and built his notion of the natural world around, by observing things closely in nature, we see a reality on a higher plane that's not technical. And it doesn't it doesn't reveal itself in lists anymore. You've got to put this storyline along with it. And what he's doing, and what I think you could say we've been doing ever since, is moving back and forth between this technological scientific understanding of things, which at first complicates and, and is a troubling you know, contradiction of the stories that we like to tell. And then we evolve some new storytelling mechanism, some new way of thinking about things that accommodates that. And then it kind of goes back and forth like that. But I think that whether you approach nature, you know, as a birder making lists, as an ecologist, you know, noting relationships among species, or just as somebody who likes to go out and, and walk around, there's always these two things present. There is, oh, look, there's that. Isn't this neat? At a sort of uh, physical, tangible level. And then there's this higher order, wow, man, what does it all mean? You know, <laughs> and Guillaume was a 19th century version of that. And the language has changed. Um, the, the participants in that conversation have changed. Uh, but I do think that that, that basic uh, internal dialogue is still going on. And, and, uh, it has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it reminds me a little bit of um, Debalkov's idea about the lily. <clears throat> His idea that you know a lily is a beautiful flower, but it's um, more beautiful to uh, a botanist, and it's even more beautiful to someone who studies flowers, and even more beautiful to somebody who specializes in the lily. And that there is no way to approach a full understanding of anything. That our understanding of beauty is a kind of increasingly uh, increasing the closeness to the knowledge of the thing. And so I think that you can look at that quantifying element um, in a uh, product oriented way, acquiring summits or acquiring mileage or you know acquiring birds on life lists. Um, or there's a way of also thinking about it from a way of sort of um, quantifying it in a more qualitative way. If that, that sounds like an, argue, uh, an oxymoron, right? Qualifying a quantitative qualification. <laughs> um, but as, as the son of two birders and the son of an ecologist, um, my parents are avid you know, travelers around the world looking for um, the, the rare bird that flies in. And there's a way in which the knowledge of that thing, specificity of that thing can also create a kind of beautiful awareness um, of it as well. So I was always struck by the, the polarity of that, of, of what's driving. Is it, is it purely acquisitional or is, is there something else going on? I, I do think that there is the, the risk of substituting an mm. acquisitional mindset or, uh, or, or privileging it as, as the only one that counts. So when you talk about, you know, summits summited or, you know, miles accomplished, um, there, I'm, uh, I'm sensitive to, and I think that the ecological world and the hiking world is becoming more sensitive to this problem of, you know, if, if you've got to have knowledge to have full appreciation, well, then you're walling all sorts of people away from that sure. appreciation and away from that experience. But, you know, to me, the perfect example of the person who uh, who, who thinks in that sort of list-making way was Myron Avery, who in the 1930s really got the trail built. Right. And he was, uh, he was intensely interested in the mountains, but as he, he wrote hardly anything about how beautiful nature is and how much he enjoyed walking around in it. He, but he, he published and accounted for you know, roots and peaks and, and uh, you know, he wanted everything to be recorded in just the right manner. Um, so clearly that, that strain of natural thinking, if you will, is a big part of it. Um, but it's definitely not 
you know, the only part I would argue mm -hmm. with, without trying to be dismissive, you know, towards your parents and the avid birders of the world. <laughs> I, you know, I, um, you know, uh, that's a component. It's a, yeah. it's an important component. Um, yeah. but I think there's more as well. Wasn't it Avery who sort of famously got in the tiff with the national geographic Yeah, who, 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 who wanted to come write a story, but he refused he, unless it was his version of the story. Right. Yeah. He couldn't believe that they didn't want to publish his article, which was basically an, an encyclopedia entry about the trail. And when they said, well, you might, you know, here's a different way to approach it. Or he just kept writing letters back to them saying, no, actually you're mistaken. This is the article that you want. And uh, they never resolved it. Speaking of quantum, yeah, it was 15 years after the fact, I think if my memory serves that yeah, they finally yeah. ran the piece that would then change the course of the AT in certain ways. Yeah, um, that uh, it, it made the trail, it was, a, it was a sign that the trail was now uh, a, a substantial part of the American landscape um, and the National Geographic. I mean, you and I are an age the, uh, I don't know, did your family have subscription to National Geographic? Mm -hmm. Mine yeah. did. I mean, I can remember those yellow binded magazines piling up on the bookshelf. Yeah. Um, and that was in the 1970s. Back in the 1930s and 40s, it was this huge publication. Um, so when the AT made National Geographic, at some level, it, it was a real thing. It was a real place in the world at that point. Um, and in part because the way that they framed the article was uh, noting that the previous year somebody had hiked the entire length of the trail in, in one go, uh, Earl Schaefer, that caught the attention of a woman, uh, Emma Gatewood, who read the article, and she was the 67-year-old grandma who threw hiked the trail in, you know, canvas sneakers and a duffel bag over her shoulder. Right. And this is really when that concept of through hiking began. Yeah, um, Schaefer pretty much, he, he definitely put the concept on the map. Um, it wasn't a terribly popular thing to do for decades after that, but in the 60s, when a new wave of back to nature came around, uh, through hiking became very popular, and then the, the fact that Earl Schaefer had been the first got unearthed, and he became much more prominent then. Um, at the time that he did the through hike in 1948, uh, the organizers and builders of the AT had very little interest in it. Um, they thought through hiking was a stunt. The trail certainly hadn't been built for that purpose, um, but it was very important to Schaefer. It was how he tried and to a large extent did get his life back together after World War II. Um, and so, it, yeah, that is, uh, you know, um, among the seminal events in AT history for sure. Mm -hmm. And I'd love, to, I'd love to go back a little bit to sort of the turn of the 20th century, which I found is one of the most fascinating parts of the book. And because it feels like there's, we're at sort of, we're reaching a tipping point um, culturally, sociologically, technologically, geographically. Um, there was a, a quote that stood out to me in, in chapter two from um, William Goodall Frost, who was the then president of Kentucky's Berea College, um, who said of Appalachia in 1899, it is a longer journey from Northern Ohio to Kentucky than from America to Europe for one day's ride brings us into the 18th century. And I'm curious about this moment because this is also at the same time when, and this was a wonderful statistic uh, I found uh, or admired in the book, that the Boy Scout handbook was second in book sales in this country only to the Bible, right? So for years. Okay, so you've got this sort of early, the, the dawn of the 20th century is happening. You've got parts of the country that are entering the 20th century. And then according to Frost, parts that are still in the 18th century, not even 19th. And so I'm curious about some of the conflicts that were also happening regionally, because this is a project that engages um, with not just an enormous swath of geography, but, you know, Georgia at the turn of the 20th century is a very different place from Maine at the turn of the 20th century. And urban areas are very different places from rural areas. And I'm curious about how that part of the story was taking place in terms of its conflicts and in terms of some of the interplays taking place, uh, because this seemed like a really important moment in the, the, the concept of this larger project coming to fruition. Yeah, I think that 
perhaps the, sh the, 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 the shortest way to put it is that the emerging urban and suburban middle class of the early 1900s needed for itself a, a rustic, nostalgic nature. Mm -hmm. And it decided that it was going to find and or create that thing for itself in the Appalachian Highlands. Um, so uh, I profiled this writer, Horace Kephart, who was uh, a, 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 a big city librarian le leading a comfortable middle-class life. And, and he goes to the mountains of North Carolina and sort of creates this persona as a backwoods writer and, and becomes very famous doing it. And then leads the effort to get Great Smoky Mountains National Park established. Well, to establish the national park, you had to evict the so-called mountain people living and making a livelihood out of the mountains at that time. So we think of national parks as protecting nature, but protecting nature in the national parks has always involved eviction. And obviously uh, native populations long before the European American uh, uh, mountain people of the you know, late 19th, early 20th century. So, there is in the creation of national parks of that time, in the creation of the AT, one way to tell the story is that it's people discovering nature in a, in a, in a wonderful way. And it was that. It also was people of a certain class and with a certain set of powers and privilege uh, building a landscape for themselves by denying it to others. Um, and um, so, the, you know, that's, that's a part of the story. Mm -hmm. And it seems that even in that chapter about Kephart, which you're, you're talking about here, I mean, that's also the chapter of Memory Serves where um, he had traveled to Germany and kind of brought back this idea of- That was a, that was a different Taylor. guy. Sorry, yeah, that was yeah. James Taylor a little bit later, right? Um, in, a, in a subsequent chapter, right? But that seems to play in here as well, the idea that now, not only what are we going to nature for, is it for recreation, is it for spiritual renewal, is it for, for health, but also for these sort of ideas of, of, of culture in a sense, like, and yet, as you point out, one has to be substituted for the other or one evicted in, in place for, for another. But that's part of the story too. Yeah, um, yeah. What James P. Taylor in Vermont, um, I think, discovered in Germany. I couldn't fully nail it down, but was this idea of um, you know nature not just as as an individualistic escape for certain people, but it's a place where our entire community can build a deeper connection into nature and that'll bring us together that'll give us productive things to do it'll be economically rewarding socially rewarding etc um so again whether you're talking about you know the economics of just somebody trying to get away to a retreat in the woods or these social elements those things all bake together into why and how we created these spaces. And this book happens to be about the AT, but it could just as easily have been about, you know, so many other uh, places that we did, uh, I'm speaking to an English instructor, with which we did that in the, uh, you know, in the 20th century, and I think have, you know, continued to do. Yeah. So let's go off, uh, off book for just a second, um, literally. I'm curious, having done all the work on this book for years, both hiking parts of the trail yourself, interviewing people, doing the deep dives on the research, reading other people's biographies, surely some stories got left out. They had to. And I'm curious if you had a director's cut version, like if there was one chapter or one figure, or one story that you ended up deciding, you know what, it doesn't just doesn't quite seem in, but I'd have loved to, I'd, I'd have this as a bonus track. Is there anybody <laughs> out there or, or um, some stories that you had to leave behind or would have explored further if you had more time? How about that? That's an option too. Well, yeah, I, I could think of a, a couple things. Although again, to be honest, you know, 
this was more like writing a paper for college than I realized. You know, do your students tend to have director's cuts that they left behind or were they cranking copy out to get it in right. on time? Um, so there are not like sheafs of paper laying around the house that didn't make it in. Um, one thing that I was hoping to be able to do that I didn't get to do. Um, there you go. Let's do it from that angle. Well, I am... Uh, I imagined that uh, Bill Bryson would allow me to, uh, I hope it's okay to share this. Um, I had thought that a way to write that chapter would have been to get access to his notebooks from mm. his hike. And I thought that I could tell a, a behind the scenes story of, uh, you know, of, of his time on the trail. And uh, he, I, you know, he was incredibly gracious about giving me time and giving me a really candid interview about the writing of the book and his career, you know, um, and he had no interest of his own in doing it. I mean, the days of publicizing this book or any of his books are long behind him. He's, he's basically retired at this point, but he took the time and that was a great thing to do. Yeah. But I did have this imagined scenario where I was going to fly over to England and, you know, he'd pull his notebooks out of a box and I'd spend two days taking notes on them. That didn't happen. Um, there were some, at one version of the book, imagined several sidebars that would have delved more deeply into some things and those, you know, those didn't come to pass. But most everything that I cooked up actually, you know, is actually in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, good. Well, let's talk a little bit, uh, push a little bit further in there. What do you think was the most surprising thing you came across? The, the thing that you that just made you think, wow, I never would have thought that was a part of this story. Um, I had no coming from it, coming to it from where I did, I knew about Benton Mackay, the person who put the idea out there. Uh, I really didn't know about Myron Avery, the person who, I think the only term for it is compulsively got the thing built. Um, mm -hmm. And Avery was driven, compulsive, he was rude. He, I think it's, it's a good thing that he didn't live in the age of the internet because he managed to dictate and mail so many letters of such great length, full of such hostility towards whoever he was writing to um, that it's just, it's not a, a, a mindset or an approach or a personality that we would ordinarily associate with you know, a retreat into nature. Um, uh, urban planning folks like me, uh, and, a, and a lot of people know the, the, the name of Robert Moses, who almost single-handedly rebuilt New York City in the, in the 20th century. And the famous book about Moses uh, is titled The Power Broker. Um, and Myron Avery was this Robert Moses-like power broker over the, over the Appalachian Trail. Um, and I still find it, and, and there's lots of reason to believe that if he hadn't been there and hadn't been that way, we wouldn't have an AT nowadays. If it didn't, if it hadn't gotten to the point that it did before World War II really, you know, um, stalled the effort, um, I'm not sure that we would have been able to build it, the, the parts that were remaining from scratch after the war, only because they had already been there once. And because he was so driven after having gotten it built once before the war, he, he drove the process of getting it rebuilt after the war. Um, if, if that character hadn't been there, I don't think we'd have the trail, but um, definitely getting to know him was, um, was, uh, was surprising. Yeah, we've talked a lot about the <clears throat> AT getting built um, and it's built built quality, um, but it's one thing to build the thing and it's another to maintain it. Uh, I was very struck by this quote midway through the book where you write, it turned out that a path through nature required a lot of effort beating back nature just to keep it intact. And I, I think that's something that we rarely think about, um, not just for things like you know, hurricanes and the natural world coming through, small things like trees falling across trails, but just the idea yeah. of um, how one, after one has acquired the land, whether through eminent domain or donation, whether one is having it managed by the park service or by another bureaucratic government agency. Um, I was struck by the tension between the collaborative elements 
of local clubs who will maintain different sections and then the larger oversights that are taking place, who's funding this, who's funding that. Um, but I'm, I rarely stop to think about who actually is going out and clearing trail and making sure blazes are still yeah. visible. Yeah, and it's, it's hundreds of volunteers organized into dozens of clubs that then all fall under the umbrella of what's now called the Appalachian Trail Conservancy. But it does take a ton of work. And, you know, there's a small professional staff at the ATC, but the, the folks that are out there clearing away overgrowth and trees that have fallen down and doing their best to build the trail in a way that it will cause less erosion. And sometimes that means building steps or putting down, uh, you know, ground cover. Um, all of that are folks volunteering weekends and going together on these club outings to go out and, and keep the thing, keep the thing running. Um, so the, the trails history and present day life as a public private partnership so you've got the federal government in the form primarily of the National Park Service, but also the U.S. Forest Service uh, overseeing almost all of the land that the trail runs through. Then they have a partnership agreement with the Appalachian Trail Conservancy to actually manage the trail, which in turn has relationships with all these individual clubs down to individual members who say, OK, this two mile stretch is mine and I'm going to go out there every March and you know, make sure it's passable. Um, that, that network, that pyramid um, is what makes the trail go. And it, it took a long time to pull together. And, and still, I think it's a really admirable part of the thing. Um, sometimes for, you know, there are all sorts of partisans affiliated with different parts of the outdoor world. There are a lot of folks out there who are very partial to the Pacific Crest Trail on the West Coast as a more natural, more remote, more demanding long distance trail. Um, and you know that may well be true. I don't care to get into that debate. But the thing about the PCT is that it runs almost entirely through federally managed land. And um, uh, it doesn't have this, this history and this life of this public-private partnership in, in involving hundreds of people. Um, to the same extent as the AT. And so I, I think that that's, a, that's a, a really neat part of the AT's history. I have to say, you know, for all of the hundreds of people who are on this call from California, um, I, know, I know there are volunteers on the PCT, um, but uh, I'm just saying that, that ethic and that part of the AT's life is really what, what produced it in the first place. And so it has, it's been a part of it ever since. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, and I was fascinated, especially in the second half of the book, as we think, and again, it's my background growing up as the son of an ecologist uh, who was given Aldo Leopold Sand County Almanac as a birthday present on, on my 13th birthday, notions of stewardship. But there are a lot of um, strong conversations about what stewardship looks like. Is it the stewardship of will, pure, pure wilderness? Uh, is it a stewardship that um, sets aside access to uh, how do we interest young people in the natural world so that they grow up interested in taking care of and preserving and thinking about wild places? Um, sometimes that means bringing a road in to allow access to a place. Other times it means keeping a road out. And I was struck in the later years of this story, Phil, to the way in which the different progressive movements of our country and the different environmental movements occasionally bump heads um, when we have uh, advocates for wind power, for example, um, who are looking to increase natural energy, bumping up against um, people who want to have a wilderness that has not even uh, in sight lines, uh, the built world. Um, and I put that in quotes since the trail itself is a built landscape, right? Um, and how one wrestles with those thorny questions is, a chapter that hasn't been written yet because it's in the future, right? Like what will the AT and our relationship to it as a nation look like as a culture 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now? Yeah, you know, I, I brought up that specific case with, with my students this past semester of the controversy over wind turbines that were gonna be built on a mountain in Maine. Um, and the 
Appalachian Trail community said, you can't sully our trail with this view of wind power generation. And other folks saying, well, if what we care about is the environment at this point in time, uh, we need to care more about clean energy than about you know, a scenic viewpoint. And what my students said was that, or at least some did, but this really caught on was, you know what? We can see what people were saying when they said they don't want to see wind turbines from the trail because one is natural and the other is energy producing. But they said to us, na the, the natural world and, and the world that we find ourselves in nowadays, the clean energy from the wind turbines goes hand in hand with the appreciation of nature of uh, and walking on the trail. And, and you know, some students were saying, well, I could imagine actually enjoying the trail more knowing that, you know, it not only was a place for me to escape and see the woods and the trees, but to also see uh, a different, brighter future of clean energy. Hmm. Um, so I think that, and I've just in the past couple of years, my students in the way that they think about and talk about the building of environment, it's shifting so much from even, you know, a few years ago and light years from the kind of distinctions and the black and white either ors that I think you and I grew up with. So um, a very different worldview and perspective is emerging out of young folks. It's more inclusive of, of different peoples, different kinds of places, different ways of thinking about the relationship between uh, the built world and the natural world. And, um, you know, I think stuff is going to bubble up out of that, that, mm -hmm. you know, in some way that, that we, and certainly, you know, uh, Aldo Leopold, you know, wouldn't even recognize. And it's, yeah. it's exciting. It's daunting and a whole bunch of other things, but um, you know, it's interesting. Exciting. Yeah, no, that's a really interesting viewpoint. And I want to keep thinking about it. Um, it reminds me a little bit of, I teach a class on the Rust Belt and the literature of the Rust Belt. And we talk about the way in which the, the smokestack, the industrial smokestack was at one moment, uh, a sign of progress, a sign of prosperity, a sign of, of the future. Uh, now, if anyone shows a picture of a smoking smokestack and an ad campaign, the first word you're thinking is not prosperity or progress or future, you're thinking pollution, um, right? And so I know these aren't exactly the same, then, I'm approaching it from the opposite point of view, but the way in which signs and symbols shift um, as we think about them culturally, historically. And I think the more recent shift is, well, if you show a picture of a smokestack and there's not smoke coming out of it, then people are thinking about that as maybe a post-industrial uh, uh, habitat of some kind or a site for uh, uh, an urban ag operation that'll grow food in a more low energy way. And so these, these the idea that sort of the industrial over here and the green and agricultural over there, those lines are starting to blur as, as well. It's it, it, all these old symbols and sort of um, shorthand for what the world looks like, you know, they don't, they don't represent the same things anymore, I don't think, um, or at least that's that's shifting pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the book does a marvelous job, I think, of showing the way in which what do we carry into the natural world from our own lived worlds in what's oftentimes as the civilized world, I use that air quotes there. Um, what do we carry with it? What do we project onto it? What do we seek from it? What do we hope to gain by going into, into, the, into the wild? Going um, um, even before Cheryl, Cheryl, Cheryl Strayed went into the wild, right? Like this is, what do we seek when we go there? Um, I wanna just check in with John. I can talk all, all night, but um, we've only got about 10 minutes left. And I wanted to see if there were questions coming through yet or encourage folks to put questions through. John, where are we at? We do have some questions. Uh, I think we have enough questions to, to take us to the top of the hour. Terrific. Um, but if folks have questions, they can continue to submit them and I'll try to squeeze some in before we have to go. Um, Gary writes, do you think the AT could ever be extended and grow physically or even metaphorically? And when will you write a biography of the Lisha kill? <laughs> Hi, Gary. Um, uh, the Lisha kill, actually, which is a stream in Niskayuna, New York. Um, there is uh, an expansion. There's something called the International Appalachian Trail, 
which takes the geological reality of the mountains and notes that they don't just stop at Mount Katahdin in Maine. They go all the way up into Atlantic Canada and all the way over to the Atlas Mountains, their counterpart over in Africa. And so there has been this effort to create this, this new follow-on trail. It's not a project of the Appalachian Trail Conservancy uh, or the Appalachian Trail as a unit of the National Park Service. They've got plenty you know, on their... Um, on their plates there. Um, some of the initial versions of the AT and other long distance trails did include not just this isolated trail that runs up the spine of the mountains, but the side trails that come down into communities and can, you know, or, or you know, natural areas on the sides of the mountains, but eventually connecting into small towns, maybe even big cities, um, which I think, you know, we could do more of. Uh, one place that I know of is, you know, right now you can get on the um, the canal towpath for the, not the B&O canal, but um, in Washington, D.C. It's a protected former canal towpath that runs from the District of Columbia all the way up to Harpers Ferry, where it intersects with the Appalachian Trail. And I love this idea of, the, and I'm not the first one, the National Trail System Act imagined this, Benton Mackay did, that, you know, we could, you could, create more seamlessness by creating these, these branches that, that come off of it. Um, so I think there are opportunities to expand it, but the AT as, you know, the AT, I think the one thing that they're spending a lot of time on now is protecting adjacent lands. They work in partnership with local land conservancies and state or local governments. Can we protect you know, this larger piece of property to protect the trail environment, both for scenic reasons and, and ecological reasons. That's where most of the expansion now is going on, as I understand it. Uh, and the next question, our last question is uh, related. Uh, Adam writes, do you think the age of piecing together these long through trails is over? Or do you think the demand for long, quote, remote trails like the AT and the PCT will lead to government continuing to develop new ones? I think that um, the, the current socio-political environment makes projects like this a lot harder to do. Um, and so there, there are ongoing efforts in all sorts of places to piece together trails. Here in Ann Arbor, we've got the border to border trail that has been coming together in little bits and pieces over many, many years now. And, and um, but the sort of the, the ethic or the idea when the federal government took responsibility for the Appalachian Trail in the 1970s, you know, was a notion of government serving public good that just had a much greater degree of buy-in and acceptance than unfortunately I think we have today. So, um, you know, individual small scale efforts, um, a lot of times things can happen at the community scale that don't, um, you know, regardless of the partisan affiliations of the people within the community, because it's operating as a community thing, a lot more can get done. But if you get up to these higher levels of, of something needing to move hundreds of miles and through different communities where you've got a somewhat robust public bureaucracy involved, um, I, I think the prospects for that are not great in the near term. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, Jeremy, we have maybe time for one more question if you wanted to take the, the last question, if there's something you, you, didn't, you didn't get to. Something the question I always off. ask at the end of an interview is, what's the question I should have asked? <laughs> um, geez, I don't want to bore everybody with flattery, but um, you, <laughs> uh, uh, you ask great questions um, and, and so nothing immediately leaps to mind. Um, uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anybody that we didn't touch on from the book that deserves a mention. Um, we hit quite a few of the chapters in, in one way or yeah. the other. So I me. think yeah. I think if you can't think of anything and I can't think of anything, then uh, it's not the end of the world if a Zoom meeting ends five minutes early. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, let me let me hold this up one more time and say it was a marvelous read, Phil. It was a real pleasure to talk to you tonight to see work go from 
early chapters at the Institute for the Humanities and our cohort there and uh, to find it between covers. Uh, it is a marvelous read. It really drew me through. Um, and I think it's a marvelous contribution to um, both literature about the environmental movement and the environmental um, 20th century, uh, how we think about wilderness, uh, how we think about place and what we carry into the natural world. And even thinking about what we believe the natural world is and what it offers us. So um, I'm sure John will give us the link for Literati. But yes. You can all, all please get a copy of this uh, marvelous book. It was a wonderful pleasure to read and pleasure to talk to you, Phil. Thank said, you, Jeremy, so much for doing this. Um, it was it was right. very good of you to do it. Um, uh, if I could just add a plug, uh, y'all, um, the $5 donation to Literati for hosting the event would be a wonderful thing to do because Literati has been a hub for all of us through this um, through this time that we've been through over the past 15 months uh, and it doesn't happen free, so. Thank you for yeah. that. Yeah, uh, Phil Deniri, Jeremiah Chamberlain, thank you so much for joining us at At Home with Literati. You can of course purchase the Appalachian Trail. There's a link in the chat and there's a link on the page that brought you here this evening. And of course, if you live in Ann Arbor, you can walk into the store and it should be on our shelves. Um, but uh, thanks again for joining us and we'll see you all at the next event. So take care and have a great night all.